Hello, everybody, and welcome to a &J Gaming. This is your host, Andrew, though some of you hopefully know me as the greatest Magic player in the world. All right, today I have something a little different for you, though, so we're actually going to get a nice new background in here. Oh, yeah, isn't that nice? A totally majestic, beautiful artwork. You see, it actually took me like 37 hours to come up with this design. Yeah, okay, enough of that. Anyway, we're going to do a board game review uh, mixed in with a how to play. It's a nice late game. I figured I'd get both in. The game we're talking about is Crypt. Now, this was uh, a game I actually kickstarted, so I'm going to apologize now if some of the stuff I mentioned isn't included in the retail version. But uh, just keeping it at its bare bones bit, uh, no matter what they cut out, you know, the fancy extras, it is still a solid game. So. Do keep that in mind, but don't weigh too heavily on it. Now, this is a very interesting game. It's a very light game. Uh, just to give you an idea of the size, here's a magic card. Really not a big box. Easy to throw in your game bag and forget about it. And it is a one to four player dice slash worker placement game. You're treating the dice as the workers. Uh, so it really is technically a worker placement game. But they use the dice in a really interesting way, and I wanted to mention that. Now, the neat thing about it is if you decide to buy second copy, you can all of a sudden take it up to eight players. But uh, as I mentioned, I kickstarted it. I don't know if they have a retail version that includes these, but if you get the chance and do pick up the game, I'd check them out if I were you. It is the two to eight player rule variance, so it gives you a couple different ways of playing with bigger player counts, mixing things up a bit, and uh, it's just a really nice high quality book. It even gives you a score log on the back, not that anybody would really want to write on their rule book. Uh, the other nice thing is a little player board. I'll show you how this sets up in just a minute. But opening the box, you're going to see something like this. You're going to see a nice high quality rule book, nice big print, plenty of pictures, everything's explained. And again, using a magic card as a reference, it really isn't big. Uh, you also might have noticed when you open the box, it says place exhausted servants here. Oh, well, that's interesting but I'm going to leave that right here so we can get into exactly what that means in a minute. All right, a whole bunch of different colored dice, very regal looking color settings, and a whole stack of cards. So I'm going to flop the dice out right here, and I'm going to go with you card, uh, chunk by chunk what all the cards are. Uh, these first four are your player cards. You have a female side and a male side, and the artwork's... I, I love this artwork. It's goofy. It reminds me of Willy Wonka. I don't know why. Uh, probably one of the spoiled kids on there. But at the beginning of the game, everybody chooses who they're playing. So you just take your dice here, because they uh, give you a nice little spot for it on the bottom there. And you set them up. And it doesn't matter what face they're on, because you haven't even started the game yet. And your opponent will do the same thing. So let's say they're playing this creepy guy, just so I have it out here. And they would do the same with the dice. So now that it is a two-player game... I will show you what the board's for. Aha, see how it spells out a two on it? But what if you wanted to play with three players? Oh, well, hey, that's really cool. It says three on it. And then, of course, you'd flip this over to get four plus. Because if you can focus nice for me, camera, I'd appreciate it. It has this really neat little, well, whatever, it doesn't want to cooperate. Anyway, this says 6 to 8 on it, so it lets you know that, hey, this is going to be used in the bigger games, too. Cool. Like I said, we're focusing on two-player for this explanation. So we got the player cards out of the way. Now we have... Move this back up here just so you can gawk at the other cards while I'm talking about these ones. Lights Out and Leader. Uh, leader would be who starts the round. Lights Out is traditionally who ends the round. And at the end of each round, they get past one... Uh, person sideways uh, to the left and the interesting thing about the two player is whoever starts is also the one who finishes and I'll get into that in just a second. Now we have these collector cards. Uh, if you guys have played Splendor this is kind of similar. Their name, uh, the prerequisites for getting them and there are two types of prerequisites. I will get into those later. But this is just a parameter one. Once you hit these parameters, you enable this effect. This is a more active. Whenever you activate this, you get to use it. 
We'll get to that in just a minute because it won't make sense until we talk about treasure. Glorious treasure. Why are we hunting treasure? Well, the flavor of the game is your rich old dad just died. And he didn't leave you kids much. Or he didn't leave you a lot because you're all kind of spoiled little barons and baronesses. So you decide to send your servants into the, his tomb to try to... I think this is supposed to be the crypt. This is actually the box. I just love that there's art inside. I had to show it off now. But you're sending your servants in to fight your brothers and sisters' servants over the heirlooms that you never got. Well, that's one way of handling uh, getting written out of the will, I guess. Not what I would do personally, but so be it. All right, so let's say for this first round, let's just get into how this works out. For this first round, I'm going to have the leader and the lights out card. Um, and then you'd go to set up the board once the round starts, and this little arrow shows you you start here and you go around this way. For two players, there are these two lit up doors and one dark one. Now, if you don't have the board, it tells you in the book what this means is there are going to be two face up treasures everybody's fighting over, and there's going to be a face down one. Now, the neat thing about the face up treasures are I'll show you the little anatomy of the card. You have what type of treasure it is and the victory points of the card. But the hidden one, you at least get to know the type, but you don't know what the victory points are, so it's a gamble. And there are five different types of treasures. We have these scrolls, these tapestries, uh, ceramics. It's a bone, I don't wanna know what it is. And let's say statues for this one. But my turn comes up first. Now, there are two possible actions you can take on any of your turns, and I'll, uh, I'll get into that second action a little bit later. It won't really make sense if I mention it right now, so just bear with me, but I will get to it. The first action is you can place any amount of dice you want on any number of the treasures out here. The only ruling for such is you can place whatever number on it. It doesn't matter. They're not going to say, oh, you have to at least put two on this because it's a two-point worth one. No, they don't do that. But they do say, if you want to put two dice on it, they have to match. Same thing with adding a third die. It just has to match the other two dice on it. So the reason you can add more to it and you can really mess with the value of the dice is because, well, let's just take a quick turn like so. Okay, so I put a four over here because I really would like this. That's a lot of points. I'm going to put a three right here because I figure it's worth three power just to get a start off. And this mystery one, uh, you know, I'm going to put a two on it. I don't know anything about it, but it's worth it. So this is what, let's call it the strength of the servants there, or how much effort they're putting into it. And them putting more effort into it means they're probably going to get you the treasure, but they might get exhausted, and I'll come into that in just a moment. So now it goes to the other person's turn. They have three dice to play with. But maybe they don't want to waste them all right now. Maybe they want to see what happens to you. Maybe they're fine with giving this one up because they're going to put a six right over here. And now this die that you just used goes back to your card. Mm. And then they're going to look around and they're going to bump this two off with their three. Okay, so all they had to do was just make it more powerful than yours. And they bumped your dice back to your card. Their turn's over. Now because you have the lights out card, it'll come back to you. But... You only get two if you decide to place dice, place them on one card this time around, just so you don't have too much of an advantage, I suppose. Man, that six is really intimidating, but I really wouldn't mind getting that treasure. So all you have to do is beat it. You can't beat it on a single die, but you can beat it on double fours. So let's slide that right off. His card goes back, or die goes back. All right, well, clearly he's going to win this. So he's going to take his treasure. He will look at it. I will not see it. And he will put it face down in front of him. I win this one. It was face up. So everybody knows what it is. But it's now in front of me. It goes face down. And then he has... or this, There's this other card over here. Again, I win it. I look at it. It goes face down. But what do you do with all these dice here? Well, this is where your servants might get exhausted. These fours I placed, why is it a big deal that they're fours? Well, it's, like I said, how much effort your servant's putting in. So what you do after they claim the treasures, any servants that were out here on the board, you then roll to see if they will come back or if they need to take a nap. So fours, that means I have to roll a four on each of these dice to get them back or higher. So I can roll a five or six as well, but 
like this one. Of course, it rolled off screen, but it was a six, so it would go back to my player card. But this two goes to the box of shame. Goes away, and that ties into what the third action is. So at the end of each round, everybody sees which servants they have that are exhausted, which ones are fine to come back to work the next day. And you might end up losing most of your card to that, and I've actually, in a couple of games, just gone all out and lost all my dice to it. So next round comes around, these get passed over, new treasures all come out, and play would continue with the same thing. And that other action I told you I would mention is you can spend your turn to just grab all your dice out of the box, put them back on your card, and forcibly refresh them for the next round. Well, that's all well and good. So let's, using the two treasures I got earlier as an example, I have these two, they're both the scroll type. Well, now I unlocked this bonus, which says each scroll is now worth four coins. You know, it doesn't really matter as much for this one. I'm not really gaining points on that. But hey, on this one, it's now worth two more points. So cool. But I did tell you there was the other symbol with that little swoopty swoop there. Well, what that means is, remember how when you grab the treasure, whether it was face up or not, it's going to go face down in front of you? This means that to activate this ability, you have to flip one of your treasures over. Not a huge deal, right? You're going to have the treasures. Who cares if they flip over? Well, it gives your opponents information. Because there are five of these collectors. Six of these collectors, I apparently can't count. Six of these collectors, and they all give different effects based on either the parameters that you're hitting for some of them. Hey, maybe you can do this because you've really been trying to chunk them up, but they can now play around you with the more knowledge that they have. Yes, seeing what suits you're in helps, but trying to get a feel for your victory points is still giving them information. So, is it worth it? Yes and no. That's up for you to decide. It's how you want to play the game. Uh, from there, the game's very simple. Play continues until this runs out. And in a two-player game, you're only using about half the deck. Uh, three-player game, three-quarters, four-player and above. Well, four player, the whole deck, and then after that, I'm pretty sure it's just two decks smushed together. It doesn't take too long. It's honestly 15, 20 minutes. Uh, the box gives you the estimate of 25. Uh, I think even our learning game barely took 20. It's really not hard to pick up. But I'll tell you what, it is a very cute little game. Uh, the quality's great. Uh, just gameplay-wise, though, I'm going to rate it an 8 out of 10. Now, I'm going to go into that in just a second, but for a really small game, nice little pocket size thing, an 8 out of 10 is really dang high, because there are nice, big, fulfilling games that I've played that I still wouldn't put quite that high, and I still love a lot. So let's go into why. Uh, like I said, the only thing really counting against it is the time limit. It's not a huge game, therefore you're not as invested in it. So even if you win, you're not like, oh man, I worked so hard for that, I finally won, it feels great. Nah, it's only, it's only 20 minutes, man. But it's still a load of fun for those 20 minutes. Um, the box is really nice, high quality. I love the art on the inside. I mean, the art's really nice. I, the art on the cards is a little iffy, because like some of their faces get a little goofy. Like, this guy just looks really creepy. I, I kind of want to lock my door, but I'm scared that because he's in here with me, he'll do something to me. This guy looks like uh, My Chemical Romance. You know, some of the art's a little goofy, but it's all very pleasant looking, even if it is a little on the goofy side. The dice, really nice high quality, nice rounded corners. Like I said, they're supposed to look all regal because, well, your servants can't be poor because they make you look poor. And these represent your servants, and you have this nice royal purple. It just it's, it's my favorite. That's why I'm mentioning it. Yeah, the black doesn't look super ritzy, Big deal. It's the golden pips, everything, I love it. The components are great. The cards are good quality cardstock. The board, go ahead and laugh about the board because I do a little bit here and there because it folds up like this. But guess what? The box isn't even that big. And it fits right in the box and you still have room to spare. If they'd have made it something bigger and more ornate, it just wouldn't work right. And you know what? For all that you're getting out of this tiny box, uh, I honestly, if you guys find it at your local game store, I'd pick it up. I mean, I could give you a price figure on this from what they paid on the Kickstarter, but it wouldn't even be accurate once it hits retail level. So I'm going to guess at around 15 bucks. 
15 to 20 for a pocket-sized game really isn't bad. You get two of them, you have a nice bigger game. I'm sure it would be crazy with eight players, and I really want to try it. Um, but for that price point, you're looking at 30 to 40 bucks for an eight-player game. That's dang near unheard of without getting into almost arcade family style games. So, I mean, taking everything into consideration, like I said, the only thing holding it back for me is the time limit, and inherently because of the time limit is less fulfilling. But this is just an absolutely amazing game. Um, really glad I kickstarted it, and I don't say that a lot. But that's my review of Crypt. Uh, leave me a comment below, let me know what you thought of it. Uh, maybe there's some weird little idiosyncrasy with this game that I missed, or some really cute little trivia you'd like to share with me. I love trivia, especially about games, and sadly I lack a lot of it. But every time I learn something new, I'm like, oh man, I tell all my friends, and then they're just like, wow, dude, that's really cool, why'd you tell me? Anyway, this has been Andrew with your How to Play and a review of Crypt. Thank you for signing in. I will catch you all next time. Andrew, out!